When the robbery of the ABC Gold Games and More pawn shop in Danville, Kentucky turned into a triple homicide, could a nine-year-old help solve the murder? Good afternoon everyone and welcome back to my channel and Killer Concepts, the place where we talk about all things true crime. My name is Peyton. If you are new here, please make sure to hit that red subscribe button down below and turn on your post notifications so you do not miss any future content. Today we are back with another video brought to you by Oxygen. Just kidding. I just saw this case on the news section of Oxygen and wanted to share it with you, but there are plenty of other sources here as well. If this is your first time you are here watching one of my videos, then you probably don't know that I love Oxygen and I just pull a lot of my ideas for cases that they cover. This is mainly just because I hear about them through their site. I like to read their crime section and then I decide I wanna share them with you. So today we are talking about a nine-year-old Andrew Hawkinsmith and how he would help police solve a triple homicide. His parents and another after a robbery, all while protecting his baby sister. This happened at his family's pawn shop in Danville, Kentucky on September 20th, 2013. So let's jump right on into it. So on September 20th, 2013, an intruder would come into the ABC Gold Games and More pawn shop, then shoot and kill 35-year-old Michael Hawkinsmith, 38-year-old Angela Hawkinsmith, and 60-year-old Daniel Smith. According to the Lexington Herald Leader, quote, the victims were shot in the presence of the Hawkinsmith's nine-year-old son and 14-month-old daughter. The boy, Andrew, called 911 shortly after 9 a.m. to report that his parents had been shot, end quote. Both Angela and Michael Hawkinsmith were loved by the community. Michael was a youth pastor when the two first met and Angela was active in singing ministry. Michael's brother Tony said that the two either met in 1998 or 1999. The two homeschooled their nine-year-old son Andrew while raising their infant daughter at the time, Naomi. The couple would many times take their children to their place of work, the pawn shop. Per Oxygen, Michael's mother, Barbara Hawkinsmith, said the couple moved to Danville in 2013, around a decade after marrying. When they would move, Michael would involve himself in the local church. His mother said, quote, when it came to him and church, him being a parent or anything he did, it was his whole heart or nothing. End quote. Michael would eventually work part-time at the church so he could start working at ABC Pawn Shop. But it wouldn't be long until the owner of the pawn shop, Steve Devine, would make him a partial owner in his business. As I said, the couple would many times take their children into work with them, and that was the case the day of the shooting. The other victim, Daniel Smith, was described by his daughters Crystal Keeps and Stephanie Smith as a kind man who loved to help others. He was at the pawn shop to do a business deal. Smith was known to travel between pawn shops buying and selling gold. He was even called the gold man in the area. So he had an appointment that day to meet with the Hawkinsmiths to do business. The other owner of the pawn shop, Steve Devine, was also to be there that day, but he had to stay home because his wife was ill. At first, the police thought it was strange and a little bit suspicious that he wasn't there, but his alibi would check out and the police would move on to other suspects. So what exactly transpired that day? Investigators would rely on the testimony of a nine-year-old Andrew Hawkinsmith, as he was the only witness to the crime. Oxygen has the best account of what Andrew saw as they did an interview with him on their show Final Moments. So this is what I will be using for this portion for the actual account of that day. So Andrew would tell Final Moments that about 15 minutes after the store opening, while his father Michael Hawkins Smith was conducting business with Daniel Smith, a bearded man would enter the pawn shop and demand everyone get on the ground. Andrew, his mother Angela, and his baby sister Naomi would retreat and all huddle in the corner. He remembered hearing a high-pitched sound that resembled a dart gun. 
This is when his father and Daniel Smith would be shot. In an act to protect her children, Angela Hawkins Smith would tell Andrew to take his baby sister to the back of the store. She would then be shot and killed as well. In the back, Andrew would sit with Naomi on the couch before coming back out later to find his parents dead, as well as Daniel Smith. The nine-year-old boy would call 911. The nine-year-old boy would call 911, telling them that a robber had shot his parents and may still be there. In the 911 call, Andrew says, quote, they're dead on the ground. Come here quickly because I'm afraid. Please hurry, end quote. The Danville Police Department would immediately head to the location. This included Detective A.J. Mullins, Lisa Dullins, and Robert Vlad. When the detectives would arrive, Andrew would be standing there at the door with a phone in one hand while holding his baby sister. Detective Mullins would take the Hawkinsmith children back to the station, and police would start to process the crime scene. They would find that all victims were killed with a 22 caliber gun. Michael would be shot eight times in the legs, chest, and head. Angela would be shot three times in the head, and Dan Smith was shot five times in the head. Police would look to Andrew Hawkins Smith to hopefully provide a description of the suspect and he would do just that. The advocate messenger reports that Andrew described the shooter as having a fake beard. This is because there were white tips near the ears. He would even draw a picture of this for them. This would become a very important piece of evidence later on. He also described the man as a, quote, heavy set dude wearing sunglasses and a hat, end quote. Detectives say that the young boy gave a clear description of the weapon used as well. This is how they would figure out that the assailant had used a gun with a silencer on it. Oxygen noted that investigators initially considered that the murders may have been a result of a robbery, but they would change their train of thought when they would see no money had been taken from the register. The use of a silencer on the gun also had them considering a hitman as a possible scenario. Since the police had to look at many possibilities in this case, they would start contacting the victim's relatives and reaching out to others in the area. Witnesses would tell investigators that they saw a man fleeing the area in a newer model gray or silver van per Courier Journal. While the pawn shop itself did not have surveillance cameras outside of it to capture footage, many other businesses in the areas did. This would allow the police to track a path of the van to the best of their ability. It would also confirm that it was in fact a silver vehicle used and made detectives believe the killer staked out the pawn shop and or people before the crime was committed. Looking at the Hawkinsmith family, it seemed to detectives that they were a loving family by all accounts and there wasn't anything pointing to troubles that could lead to an incident such as this. Since the Hawkins Smith family seemed solid, they would look into Dan Smith. Per Detective Dolans, he would carry a briefcase from pawn shop to pawn shop. Quote, he'd have anywhere from $30,000 to $100,000 and went to known businesses on known days. So really anybody could have followed him and figured out where he was going to be and when, end quote. Investigators would use surveillance footage to track Dan Smith from multiple businesses that he went to on the morning of the murders. This included a Lawson's Jewelry in Harrodsburg, about 10 miles away from the crime. He had seemed to be in good spirits that day, but unfortunately, this did not bring them any closer to a suspect. That is until a very important phone call. A man by the name of Kenneth Allen Keith would make a phone call to a pastor in Warren, Michigan by the name of Tracy Harold. Tracy Harold had sent a message to Keith seeing how he was doing because he knew he lived in the area that the Hawkinsmiths had died. Keith would respond saying that it was the Hawkinsmith and he was so upset and would get back to him. Keith knew the Hawkinsmiths, but we will get into that more in a little bit after we dig into this phone call. So Major Kevin Peel, who was the head of the investigation, would tell the advocate messenger the following about the phone call. This is pretty much one big quote, so just kind of hang in there. Quote, 
As soon as Tracy Harold started asking what happened, he told us Keith started running this play-by-play -play of what he'd done that day, down to the exact times. Keith told Harold he'd left Burnside at 5.47 that morning to go to his pawn shop to do some work, that he left there at 7.17 to go to the VA hospital because he had an appointment at 8 in Lexington, and that he left there to come to Danville to pick up a prescription at a local pharmacy for his wife because the medication wasn't available at any other pharmacy. He added that he left Danville and had his van detailed because they were headed out on a family trip to Florida the next Sunday, end quote. According to Peel, this information didn't sit right with Harold as it kind of seemed like Keith was trying to give him his alibi. So Harold would ask Keith if he believed if it was a robbery and if the Hawkins Smiths were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. After that, Harold told Peel that Keith, quote, flipped the switch. He sounded like a different person. He told us he wouldn't have even recognized his voice if he hadn't known it was him. He said, no, the Hawkins Smiths were not good people. They were evil people. They got what they deserved. They cost me a lot of money. God judges people with a lion judgment and a lamb judgment, and that he'd chosen the lion judgment for the Hawkins Smiths." End quote. This conversation was obviously upsetting to Tracy Harold, and so he would eventually reach out to Danville officials to tell them about the strange phone call. While the phone call was strange, pieces began to fall into place for the investigators with this new information. Peel noticed that Keith was actually someone who they wanted to talk to further about the family. He called the day of the murder to offer his assistance if there was anything the officers needed. They said he wasn't a suspect at the time, but they still wanted to interview him as he knew all three of the victims. Now that they had spoken to Tracy Harold about Keith, alarm bells started really going off in their head. Police would see that Kenneth Allen Keith owned a pawn shop of his own in Pulaski County, which neighbored Danville's Boyle County. He also was a pastor at a place called Somerset Church. Police would say that even though he was technically a preacher, his approach was much different than Michael Hawkins Smith's. It seemed like his sermons may even be considered to some as a little radical. Detective Mullen said they found a YouTube video of him giving a sermon with a rifle and sling on. Looking even more into Keith, they would also find out through bank statements that Keith was previously in business with Steve Devine, the other current owner of ABC Gold. However, this relationship didn't end well, and Keith would end up owing Devine money, so Devine would sue him. The Hawkins Smiths would take over Keith's portion of the business and his half of the arrangement. On top of this, guess what kind of car Keith owned? A 2008 Silver Dodge Caravan per the Courier Journal. Police wanted more though, so they would convince Keith's friend Tracy Harold to call Keith back on a recorded line. Per Oxygen, during this conversation, he would refer to the Hawkins Smiths as crooked people and say, quote, they went into it with the whole point from day one to take over that business from me. I don't mean to speak ill, but facts is facts, end quote. In this statement, he was referring to the pawn shop the Hawkins Smiths co-owned with Steve Devine. Police would begin to really question Keith. He was beginning to become their prime suspect. He would admit to them that he had been in Danville at the time of the murders. Why, you ask? He told them that he was there at a pharmacy, which is the same thing that he had told his friend from Michigan. Danville investigators would find surveillance footage proving that he was inside a pharmacy around 9.25 a.m., but this would still be enough time to commit the murders. The prosecutor in the case, Richie Bottoms, thought that it was pretty unusual that Keith would be at that pharmacy anyway. Why would he drive to Danville when there were several other pharmacies in his hometown of Somerset? Investigators would soon learn that Keith was in Florida, and while he was away, they would obtain search warrants for his properties. Search warrants that would help police find critical 
evidence in this case, mountains of evidence. So per Bobby Curd of the Advocate Messenger, the most critical piece of evidence that police would find would be a receipt from Dan Smith's receipt book. Dan Smith carried around a triplicate book when he was doing business. If you do not know what triplicate paper is, it is just a three layered paper that when you write on it, it makes a copy on the next page. Most of these have a white sheet or the main sheet on top that the owner keeps. And then there is usually a pink or, and yellow page that they can rip off. Major Peel said that Smith was known to give the pink copy from his receipts to the person he bought gold from, and then he would attach the yellow copy to a detailed sheet showing what he had purchased. This is something that he kept in the briefcase he took from shop to shop. To see if there was a reasonable explanation as to why Keith may have this receipt, investigators would look into where all Smith went that morning. Maybe he had seen Keith at some point. However, they would find out that he had been to a Harrodsburg jewelry store and Keith had been nowhere near that area that day. So why did he have a copy of Smith's receipt and why was it found in a trash bag with money bins from Fifth Third Bank that Smith had been to to make a withdrawal? The stuff investigators would find would get even more interesting and stranger and stranger. So authorities would collect proof that Keith had been operating in many different circles under many different names. Some of these were swinger groups. They found sexually explicit and graphic pictures on his devices from different gatherings he had attended, as well as a DEA agent identification with Keith's photo and a different name. Obviously, this badge was a fake. Police would also find razors with synthetic hair on them. The type of synthetic hair would match the kind that would be on a fake beard, like the one the Hawkinsmith son had described the intruder was wearing. A broken key was also found, and police believe this belonged to the front door of the pawn shop. Keith may have broken it off in his hurry to lock the door behind him after he entered for his attack. They would find the receipt to the pharmacy that Keith was trying to use as his alibi for that morning with the time circled on it, which was to say the least unusual. So after finding a homemade target in a trash bag, Investigators drew the belief that Keith may have been having target practice outside of his own pawn shop to practice with the silencer. This is where they would find spent 22 bullet casings and these would actually match the kind of casings that were at the crime scene. According to the Advocate Messenger, police would also seize a total of six laptops, countless SD cards, jump drives, and phones. These are where they would find the explicit images, many questionable searches such as quote, how to bury money with GPS coordinates, end quote, background checks on all of the victims of the crime, just a multitude of things that a normal person wouldn't search for, especially if they're connected to the victims of a triple homicide. Police would talk to some people who knew Keith and a bunch of them didn't even know that he was a pastor and they also knew him as going by different names. A lot of them didn't even know he was married. So he was living multiple different lives from what police had found. Let alone the fact a preacher who would carry out a heinous and a depraved act such as this isn't really much of a preacher at all. As soon as Keith would return to Kentucky, he would be arrested for three counts of first degree murder for the triple homicide on October 9th, 2013. However, Keith would sit in jail for a while until he was finally given the opportunity for a trial as there were multiple things that occurred to delay the case. Finally, Keith's trial would be set for August 2017, which was almost four years after the crime had occurred. But this would all change when prosecutors would be given a call on the 1st of May saying that Keith wanted to plead guilty to the crime. Keith was facing a possible death sentence. So he would plead guilty on May 26, 2017 to life without parole. He would also plead guilty and receive 20 years in prison for both robbery and burglary of the pawn shop. He apparently gave investigators a full confession and admitted to everything, all because he didn't want the death sentence. 
The Lexington Herald Leader reports that as part of the plea agreement, $65,000 taken during the robbery will be paid to the estate of Daniel Smith and an additional $36,948 seized by police from Keith's own store would be willed to his wife, Tracy Keith, as the defense proved it was rightfully hers. The most interesting thing though, May 26th was the 13th birthday of Andrew Hawkinsmith. The nine-year-old boy who had called 911 to report the crime to authorities after his parents and Daniel Smith had been shot. Andrew told reporters about Keith's plea, quote, it's the best birthday present I could ever get, end quote. Police actually credit Andrew a ton for his bravery and have said that he played a huge role in solving this case. His eyewitness accounts helped them identify Keith and even connect some important evidence to him. Daniel Smith's one daughter, Crystal Keeps, told the Lexington Herald Leader, quote, that she was thankful the case was over and that Andrew doesn't have to testify. That is a relief from all of us. Now is a time for healing and forgiving and being able to move forward, end quote. Now let's end this with some more notes from the family of the fallen in this one. Keeps would tell final moments, quote, Dad had a previous relationship with Kenneth Allen Keith. He would come in and he would buy and sell. They did business. You're going, wait a minute, that's not a real pastor. To be able to commit murders on a Friday and get up on the pulpit Sunday morning and preach, especially in front of two children, end quote. Michael Hawkinsmith's Mother Barbara said in regards to Keith's crime, quote, we all come out on the short end of the stick, but that's okay. I don't have to answer for what he did. The man's going to have his own demons he's going to have to live with, end quote. And finally, Andrew Hawkinsmith would say, quote, I am very thankful for what I have. And in a sense, it's like I am living through my parents' life or kind of like a reimagined one. My parents will always live on within me. End quote. It may be more than 10 years ago since this crime has occurred, but my heart still goes out to all of the friends and family members of Angela and Michael Hawkins Smith, as well as Daniel Smith. By all regards, they all seem to have been great people who definitely did not deserve anything that happened to them. This crime is such a senseless and hateful act. It really was just done as an act of malice because it seems like someone was upset and felt like their business had been stolen from them. There, there just is no excuse for this kind of thing. This is all I have for you on this case and I highly recommend that you go check out my sources in the description box below. There are some things that I have left out for time's sake, but I also did try and shove a lot into this video. As always, we talk about these cases to learn from them. Never let your guard down. People snap all of the time. Even those that seem like perfectly good people. This man called himself a preacher and then committed a triple homicide. So it is just really a good example of that. If you have not done so already, please make sure to hit that red subscribe button down below and turn on your post notifications so you do not miss any future videos like this one. Should you have any case suggestions, please send them to killerconceptsvlog at gmail.com. You can also follow me on social. All of my handles are down below in the description box. With that being said, just remember that the world's most dangerous minds hide in the most unlikely places. Stay safe.